a heartfelt story by the father of one of the 2005 March of Dimes Ambassador Babies. You'll hear it coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Myrtle Beach Herald. We're focused on the annual Horry County Walk America to be held Saturday, April 30th. And we're visiting with Chris Saffles, the father of Riley Grace Saffles. Good morning, Chris. How you doing? Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Yes, sir. I did. I failed to say your daughter is the ambassador, ba one of the ambassador babies right. for this year's Walk America. Right. A really big deal. Oh, a very big deal. Um, you know, we really owe a lot to March of Dimes. They've really helped us out a lot, helped the babies out a lot. Um, you know, everything that they've ever done for the NICU unit. Um, this is something we can just give back. Just her being an ambassador is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Now, have you been to walks in the past where you've seen the role of an ambassador baby before you all signed on? Um, not really. I've right. been to walks before, but not really seen, you know, what the ambassador was all about or, right. or who it was or anything. I uh, have contributed. My brother's contributed big time. Right. Uh, but now that, you know, we are an, actually an ambassador, uh, we're more involved and, and now know what the feature should be. Oh, yeah. You know, interestingly, Dennis Wade aired on your daughter's first birthday, I believe. Right, she, right. He aired the day, January 21st. And, of course, it was so exciting to think of the, the recognition of what all had happened over the last year. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a good thing, you know, for us that we could, you know, finally, I guess, get through the time that we had with her, you know, being in the hospital and, and you know, her getting bigger and weighing more and wanting to come home and all that. This is more of a reward for us. Mm -hmm. Real quick about yourself, Chris, before we get in focusing on O'Reilly and the events mm -hmm. coming up on April 30th, are you originally from the area? I'm from Tennessee originally. Okay. Uh, I worked for Dixie Stampede, and I've been with them since 1988. 88? Uh, 88, Wow. Yeah. And so we opened up a, a facility here in Myrtle Beach in 92. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones to come over here. Mm -hmm. um, actually met a lady, uh, Tracy, my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, never went back home, kind of stayed, and been here ever since. Son of a gun. Now, Tracy's not, she's not a Tennessean. She's from the area. Right, yeah. She's from Myrtle Beach, lived in, on 30th Avenue in Myrtle Beach. Is that right? Yeah. Son of a gun. Speaking of another Tracy, I knew a, a Tracy who was a, a rider up at Dixie Stampede for a long time, Tracy Ross. Yes. She's no longer with you all, but right. I think yeah, it's gone back to Tennessee. Yep, yeah, she's from Tennessee too, and she, and uh, actually Tracy had worked at, at uh, my wife had worked at Dixie Stampede. Is that right? For 10 right? years, yeah. For that's 10 how we, years? That's how we met. Now, did y'all work in the same part of the, uh, of the Stampede? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were both riders, and uh, I was a trick rider and roam rider, which is g gymnastics on horseback, and uh, she, I'd actually kind of taught her a few things, and she learned more, and she was a trick rider, and uh, finally decided she was going to do physical therapy for a living, so she went back to school. Is that right? Yeah. How did you get into trick riding in the first place? Well, I've always rode horses. Uh, my family's always had horses. Kind of did rodeos a little bit and stuff. Uh, and just decided that, you know, I think I ought to do this for a living. And so Dixie Stampede gave me the opportunity to come in and ride and trick ride and roam ride, uh, trick rope, uh, do bull whips, stuff like that. Um, and I did that for about 12 years mm -hmm. uh, and decided, you know, I've had enough. And now I do buffaloes. So we have the buffaloes. Oh, come at the show. on. Yeah. So we You're actually riding buffalo, not riding buffalo. Oh yeah. No, we did the Indian thing where you know the Indians chase them around. Right. Um, we'd actually raised a few buffalo, me and my wife, uh, from babies on up, and uh, we have those in the show now. So we have about seven of them in the show. That's potentially pretty dangerous there. It is it? dangerous, but it really is a neat thing because a lot of people on on this side of the you know United States really didn't see buffalo a lot. Yeah. And uh, so that, uh, this is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. You said you all have seven in the... Uh, we have seven in the show, yeah. They're performing each show? Yes. Now, how yeah. often, and of course, I understand, I think you said before we started that uh, this week kicked off six days a week. Yeah, six days a week. Um, we're closed on Sundays. Right. And uh, we'll do one show a night. Uh, sometimes, like on Saturday, we'll do two shows a night. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. You know, sometimes the crowd will come in on the weekend. But Easter weekend is going to be very busy. Golly, this is a crazy weekend, yeah. I'm sure. That's right. But y'all are not performing on Sunday. You no. said y'all are always, except in the heavy summertime. Yeah, in the summertime we're open seven days a week. Chris, Sometimes what? three shows a day. Now, are you in every show? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm in every show. Sometimes we'll switch up an event or something like that, but yeah, I'm in every show. So you don't have anyone who could swap out for you, I guess? Uh, so. Sometimes, we, yeah, we do have backups. You do? Yeah, we do have backups. Sometimes we'll take off, sometimes not. It just depends, so. Have you ever had any major accidents as a... Yeah, uh, some, some. It comes with it. 
Just like a football player, NFL football player, you know, things happen. Well, those guys have a ton of padding. I mean, you, you're pretty <laughs> bare bones there. Though. Yeah, I think that's why I, I kind of, you know, got out of a little bit early and stuff. You know, uh, you know, we want to start having kids and stuff right. like that. And, and she went back to school, and I just kind of, you know, tried to do something else mm-hmm. in the show. And now, of course, Tracy's move into physical therapy right. is uh, uh, a pretty dramatic change in life there, riding horses to... I guess anything from riding horses to anything else is going to be a pretty big change. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, I mean, she could probably take care of me now, you know, when I right. get older because yeah. I've rode all this time. But, uh, yeah, she, she same thing. She wanted to start having kids, and she thought, you know, it would be a better thing if she went back to school and kind of, you mm-hmm. know, a, a bit more better career than, you know, what we're doing. Did you think about this in an early age, wanting to be a trick rider? Is uh, that... I did. I did. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Had, had that, was that a family business or was that uh, something? No, not really. I had some friends that did it. Um, I guess friends of the family that, that actually trick road and stuff like that. And, and Special Dex is what it's called. Uh, never really thought until I got out of high school this is what I wanted to do. Right. Uh, as soon as I graduated, I started working for Dixie Stampede. Up there yeah. in Tennessee. Yeah. And I'd actually worked at Dollywood before that. Okay. And then moved on into Dixie Stampede. And uh, Dolly Parton Entertainment owns uh, both? Yes. Dick Dollywood, obviously, and uh, the Dixie Stampede. Right, yeah. Y'all won Dinner Show of the Year, actually, ah, which is that, very exciting. I'm telling you, it's a really good show, yeah. I, I, honestly. That, uh, the regular show and the Christmas show, both are real good. Why would a viewer who may not have seen Dixie Stampede or been to any of the performances want to go? I mean, what is it about it? Uh, I know, obviously, our focus is on the March of Dimes, but uh, this is a big deal, and, and obviously this sure helped. As we were talking about insurance, we want to talk about that in a minute. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a dinner show. It's uh, they serve a, a four course meal, a whole chicken, uh, ribs, um, potato, and you know, as you're eating this dinner, you're watching the show. And it, uh, to me, that's amazing. Uh, you know, for to be able to serve dinner and eat. Uh, right. It's an hour and a half show. Uh, it's totally excitement. I mean, it's from when right when you walk in and sit down till you get up. There's nothing in there. It doesn't sit down. Wow, that is very exciting, Chris. Of course, the uh, the birth of your baby daughter is probably the big. Would it be the biggest thing in your life? The biggest. Really? Yes. What's that like being a dad? Uh, I've always dreamed of it. I really, really have. Yes. Always, my, my entire life, I've always oh, looked up to my dad. Yeah. You know, thinking, you know, it's got to be neat to show, you know, your kid this and that, and yeah. and raise him, and you know, and I always wanted to do that. And when Riley was born, it was the best day of my life. Wow. The best day. You and your you've been real active in the pregnancy. I mean, you you've been oh, yeah. long from the get-go? Everything. I'd go to every hospital visit, uh, doctor visit, uh, when they first put the, the little deal on there to listen to her heartbeat while you right. know Tracy was still pregnant, I was right there. Never missed a beat. Wow. Never missed a beat. Nope. Listen to that. And of course, that's why you have to have backup riders yes. there yes. so that you can do just yes. that, yes. even in the crazy uh, summertime right. schedule. Yep. What was the pregnancy like? Can you share with viewers a little bit about it? It was it, uh, everything was going good. Like you know, before, we had a son that we had lost. Is uh, that right? Yes, and uh, he uh, was actually born at 31 weeks, mm-hmm. and uh, he lived for about 30 hours. Uh, he had a grade four brain bleed, which is probably the worst you can have, uh, and and of course he didn't didn't make it from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was involved big time in that one too this one more involved because I wanted to make sure everything was fine and uh, so then uh, we you know he actually had a heart defect that we'd found out about uh, this is when, your son yes uh, right. yes and so when we went back to Charleston to figure out you know make sure this baby was fine genetically and all this stuff like that that wasn't connected to him um, you know more involved in that uh, and then everything was fine with her she was you know good heartbeat uh, everything was intact um, and, and the pregnancy was going really good Mm-hmm. And uh, until about 29 weeks, uh, we went to a child care class uh, in Georgetown and got home about 10 o'clock that night. And um, Tracy had actually had what, uh, a hemorrhage, uh, which they call placenta abrupta. And uh, so we, uh, we lived on about two or three miles from Laura's Hospital. Mm-hmm. And that's actually where Riley was born. Mm. Uh, and she was born at 29 weeks. She was almost two pounds. Um, and she was not alive actually when she was born, so they had to resuscitate her there. Uh, Apgore scores goes from one to ten, okay. and a normal baby's around eight or nine, even ten sometimes. What's an Apgar score for a viewer? And I'm sure most viewers know what that just, is, right? Um, just how she is when she comes out. Okay. Uh, alert, uh, breathing, you know, uh, the, how color her skin is, stuff like that. Uh, she was a one, so she was completely. And then they revived her. Uh, had a good heartbeat on her, and as soon as they called Florence McLeod, 
uh, they were there within an hour and picked her up. Is that right? That's the neonatal yes. intensive care unit yes. up there? Yeah. Son of a gun. And they're wonderful people. You all were quickly up there as well? I mean, uh, Yeah, uh, Tracy had actually had to stay in, in Loris, right. and I went on up to make sure everything was going good with her and with Riley and stuff like that and mm -hmm. get her up there. What's that like for you, Chris? Uh, it was, Can you even describe well, it? Well, you, you know, well, like I said, you know, when we lost our son, right. uh, you know, I I stayed in the waiting room by myself because we're we're it's it's 11 o'clock uh, when we get to Loris, and it's about two in the morning by the time they go ahead and take the baby. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the waiting room by myself. Nobody was around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, me and the Lord. That was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and him had a talk. And I, you know, I, I understood, you know, everything that I needed to do and what I'm looking forward to, you know, if, if everything goes good with the pregnancy, you know, you know, the birth and all that stuff. Right. Um, but then, you know, when, when everything was fine, the nurses came out and said, she's doing great. 100% here I go. I'm ready. You know, so it, it, it's, it's devastating to a point. Um, but you have to kind of bring yourself back up and get ready to go because you got a lot of support to do. Mm -hmm. uh, for your wife, for your baby, for yourself, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's a it'll bring you home. I mean, if you you know if you think that babies are uh, not that fragile, uh, they are. Wow, Chris, you know you think through that aspect. How could anyone get through it? And whether it's a mother, a father, all the extended family, but a premature birth impacts so many people. The it hospital, does. It does. all the folks that are caring for that child, mm -hmm. the child obviously itself. Right. Did you ever even contemplate, I guess it's y'all, the birth of your son and the loss of your son at, you said, 30 hours? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you had, there was some impact that was already there, so you potentially could gauge what it was going to be like, but I'm sure there was no way you'd ever contemplate that it would happen twice, that you'd have premature birth twice. No, not really. Not mm -hmm. really. Um, we, we actually figured, you know, our, this pregnancy was going to be great. Yeah. Nothing was going to happen. Uh, you know, we were going through the steps. Uh, she was doing what she was supposed to do. Uh, and, and nobody could even imagine that um, this would even happen to us, you know, the, the, with the first one or the second one. Uh, but the second one was even more of a surprise because we thought we were doing everything right. right. Uh, we're going to every visit, uh, making sure they could see everything, right. anything was wrong. Uh, and then it just, it happens. And wow. that's what we want to do is find out what happens to these babies and the pregnancies and all this stuff. That's what the March of Dimes is all about. 100%. If, and of course, I, I don't know, you must know, you probably know the phone number off the top of your head. If you don't, I know it. But if a viewer needed a call to learn more, if a viewer needed to get off to school now or get off to work, being about 715, what's the best number? 843-488-3463, I think. It's 843-488-DIME. They always get me over the March times, making sure we spell dime right. Yeah. So I know how to spell dime. It's amazing, you know, when you think about that. And of course, April 30th is getting so close. Yes, it is. And it's, uh, you know, we think about that. And of course, all the activities for Ambassador Babies. Your your daughter is, and Luke Warren Pe Parrott are leading the pack that day. The, the officers are there mm -hmm. to help uh, guide them out. If it's a walk, I mean, obviously, this walk occurs out at the pavilion, I think. Yes. So in an instance like that, they're walking down on the beach, and the ones like in Loris, you know, they are, there's a police escort, you know, that goes out leading them down the road. And mm -hmm. so I, I know it's a dramatic day, and obviously all the families. And Now, you've got some family in law here in the area, I guess. Yes. Or, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, her mom and dad still live in this area, mm -hmm. and all her brothers, uh, and so they're going to be there, too, for support. Chris, you said that I think you brought some props along. One I fascinating, did. I know you took out your wedding band off before we began, yes. began. What's the significance of the wedding band there other than a, your love for your wife? Well, the wedding band, uh, they do a deal on the NICU unit where uh, they can show you kind of how small the baby is. And this ring actually fit over Riley's arm and would actually go to her shoulder blade. To her shoulder blade? Yes. And so, it, you know, like I said, she was at the time that they'd done it, she was probably two pounds at about two or three ounces. Right. And so, you know, very fragile, very small, very just, you know, thin. And it just, I mean, it's, it's breathtaking when you see that. Uh, you know, and when it goes on my finger, you know, I mean, you can kind of see the size of my finger. Right. And her arm's actually smaller than that at the time. Not now, but... Not now. And when were you able to actually get close to your daughter? I mean, this was the birth was January 21st. Yeah, birth was January 21st, and she stayed in the hospital for two and a half months. Uh, and I'm going to say probably the first two months, 
um, we could, you know, kind of get near. We could touch her and right. stuff like that, but we couldn't pick her up. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of wires. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she had uh, pick lines in. She had uh, heartbeat testers, uh, heat testers, all this stuff to make sure she was staying body heat and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So very hard to kind of, you know, you couldn't really just pick her up. Right. I think I saw it was early February before you all actually got in there right. to really touch her or right. get close to her in that regard. Yeah, we were there every day. And uh, we talked to her every day, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. But um, and like I said, we could we could touch her. We just couldn't pick her up. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that was hard. Wow, Chris. Yeah, to be able to see your daughter. I guess it must be so difficult for a parent because you you want to be that protector at birth. Right. You want to begin doing right. those things, and right. obviously the doctors and nurses and all the other care folks are yep. in total control. Yeah, they are. They're uh, thank the Lord they are. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. they're like family. I mean, they they yeah. actually treat the babies as their own. Uh, all the doctors would explain everything going on. The nurses would explain everything going on, and you know, March of Dimes helped that. I mean, there's mm -hmm. grants out there that help these people, you know, go to school and learn these things or or do studies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some doctors, you know, that that. That's all they live for, mm -hmm. um, is come in and make sure these babies are on track where they're supposed to be. Right. And the March of Dimes helped that out. Oh, absolutely. F fundraising for, so and of course they kicked off a big prematurity campaign, I know a couple years ago, $75 million campaign to really try to find that cause. When we think about that, as you say, you and your wife, your wife's a physical therapist, obviously mm -hmm. she knows how the body works. I mean, right. really thinking through a lot of things. I think the first birth at 31 weeks, you said? Yep. And now Riley at 29 weeks, when you sit back and if you take the time to close your eyes, I'm sure you think about that often. You encourage folks to close your eyes, think about a daughter plan to be born in early April and a birth that occurs in late January. I mean, what's happening there? It's, uh, it's got to be a powerful thing. You brought a couple other things. I did bring a couple of things. I brought a, uh, this is called a blood pressure pump. Uh, you know what? Normally, a, a blood pressure pump would look on a human, right? A, a human. huge thing around the arm. <laughs> an adult, yeah. yeah. Right. It would be, you know, from shoulder blade to to there. This is for a preemie. Uh, a lot of times, what they'll do is, if if the arm wouldn't fit on the arm, they'd use it on the leg. Mm -hmm. And so either way, they could figure out what they wanted to do. Uh, and and it's used the same way, uh, but you can see the size of it. It's just like a band aid. Yeah, it's tiny. Very tiny. And then also brought um, a diaper. This would be a preemie diaper. And, and I, you, did you bring a normal diaper long? I mean, I didn't bring a normal yeah. diaper long. But now my my daughter is actually in threes now, right. which are probably I mean you know this tall. Oh yeah. You know compared to this diaper, when she was in this one, they actually had to fold it. You mean even that was too even, big for her? Yes, and it would even gap on the sides, so they would actually fold it up and 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 make it super small, because they didn't make anything smaller than the, than that preemie diaper, just to fit her, and NICU. You know, Chris, earlier this morning when I saw that two pounds, you know, I was trying to think, how much do my shoes weigh? I mean, you know, that's, uh, it's about that. I mean, it is, and I know we've talked about, I've had so many folks from last Friday, Carolyn Ewing was with us, uh, who's the, one of the co-chairs of the Loris Walk, and she's talking about babies, the ambassador babies up there at a pound and 14 ounces, and that, I mean, two pounds two is, pounds. Uh, how long was she at a similar weight? I mean, how long... How long before you could begin to see progress or feel progress? Were you feeling progress immediately? Uh, we were. Um, we kept a journal. They actually give you a journal inside of the NICU unit to keep, and mm -hmm. it tells you the blood pressure and the weight. Uh, it tells you the breathing, all the stuff that they're doing. Uh, she had to have a breathing tube, you know, at first and all that stuff. And it tells you the pounds of pressure and stuff, you know, that they're breathing. Mm -hmm. um, and you could, they would actually gain pounds and lose pounds or ounces. Right. Uh, and we'd be so excited because she'd be, you know, two pounds, 11 ounces that, we thought well, she's getting to come home, yeah. but normally they won't let them come home until they're four pounds really? and they hold their temperature. Mm -hmm. And so that's that was kind of a fight there for a while because, uh, you know, she was fed uh, tube wise for a long time, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know finally she, we started practicing her on the bottle and stuff like that when she's about three and a half pounds. And uh, it, it, once that happened, it just skyrocketed up. I mean, really? she just started gaining pounds. So. How about any of the complications after she began gaining and after you all got her home? What have been some of the complications and what were some of the things that you all were worried about early on? Well, the thing that mostly uh, worried us was the brain bleed. She actually had a brain bleed too. She did yes. as well. She had a grade three. And normally when the babies have a grade three brain bleed, um, they require um, you know, the pressure to be taken off the brain. Mm -hmm. So Riley had six spinal taps. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, after the spinal taps, 
they were kind of waiting because their head sizes would actually grow. And a baby's skull will let that happen for so long. And um, so once the last spinal tap was done, then what they were going to do is put a reservoir in her head and actually dra take directly from the head. Mm. Uh, so they were scheduling her for, I think it was in a week, for them to do that reservoir to put it in. Right. And uh, so they said that for them not, for that not to happen, her head would have to you know decrease in size mm -hmm. tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, within two or three days, uh, the neurologist came in and said, "This is when we're doing it." The next day, um, they canceled that and said that her head had come down. Mm. And so they said, "We'll wait a week and see what happens." Well, normally after the reservoir, they get a shunt, which goes from the head down through the stomach right. through the arm, right. and they keep that for life. And then after, I think when they're 10, they have to switch that out mm -hmm. and get a new one. Mm -hmm. um, so they did a, uh, another brain scan on her, and it, it kept decreasing in size. So they stopped the shunt going in. And so they moved her to intermediate side within the end, uh, probably a week. Mm -hmm. And they told us that um, they're going to do a final CAT scan on her before she leaves and goes home to see what goes on. Right. They did that, and normally a baby with a brain bleed uh, of grade 3 or higher or whatever, um, they have bruising or cyst or scarring in the brain, and she had none. Wow. Um, and a nurse had been there for 25 years said that's the only time it's ever happened, for a baby not to go home with a shunt or a reservoir or anything like that in her head. And so a lot of praying and a lot of people there that cared about was, Riley. I was about to say, you yes. must have gone back to that first talk with the Lord. Yes, yeah. tremendously, tremendously. You remember that like it was yesterday, or do you remember it clearly? I do what, remember what like was it was that like? What's it like communicating with uh, the Lord? I mean, particularly in a, you know, we think about plane crashing, and you're saying, God, please forgive me for my, I mean, you know, but in this instance, your wife's in Loris, you're heading to uh, Florence, your daughter's heading to Florence. You've got time. Yeah, and, a lot uh, of time. And, and it is a lot of time during that. I mean, you think, you know, you've got to hurry up and say a few things, and is he going to listen? Right. Uh, but... It is a lot of time for you to sit there and talk, and, and a lot of times when you do, you know, you talk to the Lord or something, you say, you know, take me or do something with me, you know, but yeah. just help her out. And uh, I just had a, you know, a feeling over me that just knew that this baby was going to be in His hands and it was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How powerful, Chris! You know, you think through all the activities. How do you and Tracy, when you sit back now and look back? Uh, do you begin trying to think through what did we do, what, did, what should we have done differently, what could we have done? How does the March of Dimes talk through some of the issues on prematurity? What are some of the things that can be done? Well, right now that's what we're trying to do is find out what can be done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've went over uh, several things doctors even told us. It's not because you uh, drunk a Diet Coke. It's not because this, not because of that. Um, you know, ate this or something like, you know, or, or smoked or drank or anything. Uh, some people that don't, you know, we don't drink or smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes that happens, sometimes it don't. It just depends. Mm -hmm. um, I think that w what March of Dimes is trying to do is figure out, you know, what areas are we involved in on trying to find out why these babies are born early. Right. Um, is there any connections to anything? Um, you know, or, or maybe down the road is a connection, you know, from your ancestors or something like that. Or right. that's the study they're trying to make. And trying to find out is if you know what we, what can we find out to do? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, can we grant more people to come in and work and figure out? Hey, we need you know somebody to watch these babies or the or the pregnancy pregnancy itself all this you know nine months. Um, it's just it's just a, I think it's a matter of time mm -hmm. uh, that we do find this out. And as, and, it, and the more help we get and the yeah. more money we get in to help these grants and all that. I think that's going to make a big difference. It is so critical. It makes you think about so many folks are involved, not only the walkers on the 30th, but the researchers, all the volunteers that make a walk happen, mm -hmm. that help make that happen, ambassador babies and families like your own that help get folks out there and recognize the need to help raise funds. But you have to have those funds to pay for researchers to pull away from other projects so they can focus on that. It is yeah. critical. Yeah. It, it Surprisingly, uh, for, for my daughter to stay in a hospital a day is ten to fifteen thousand dollars and if you could imagine um, you know just what a hundred dollars would do from one person right. if we had a hundred dollars from one person you know for the whole world that would be tremendously awesome um, but 
we know sometimes that doesn't happen. Right. And as more, and many corporate people as we can get, as many walkers we can get, um, you know, captains of teams, anything right. uh, helps out tremendously. Um, and I mean, it can't be done by itself. Uh, you know, I mean, that's how all charities are, and that's how all right. functions are. We just need a, as much help as we can get. She's. We got to wrap, Chris. Your daughter's 14 months old now. As you think through every step of the last 14 months, what's been the most uh, powerful part for you? I'd say probably, um, you know, her going forward in her time that she's doing. Uh, not really been expected to do as well as she's doing right now. Uh, she's almost walking, um, and you know her birthday really wasn't supposed to be till April 8th. So. She's in that area now where, I, you know, she's almost ready to talk and say a few things, and she kisses me by, and, you know, just for me to look in her eyes and say, you know, I love you and stuff like that, um, for her to be here, period, and for me to be able to hold her, that's the best thing in the world. Yeah, it's got to be. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Yes, sir. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Chris Saffles coming up next. You know, you got to think about it in human terms. You got to think about a niece or a nephew or a grandchild or a friend or a loved one or a coworker. You think simply, and you know, we talked about that closing your eyes. If you take the time to think about a due date of April 8th and a birth date of January 21st, that's not March 21st, that's not even February 21st, that's January 21st. Riley Saffles was due April 8th. She was born on January 21st. Think about the complications that are, can occur, not only for her, but for all children who are born prematurely. You know, prematurely is more than three weeks. Very premature is more than eight weeks. This was a much more than that situation. The complications are there. The ambassadors or babies are there to represent all babies born prematurely, babies born with birth defects, babies that we as volunteers and you as a viewer can make a difference in their lives. Give the March of Dimes a call, 843-488-3463. There's a Walk America in your community or somewhere close by. That phone number, they can help you find the one closest to you that you can be a part of, or you can get down to the Horry County Walk America at the Pavilion on April 30th. It's a Saturday. It'll be a beautiful day, rain or shine. Get out to support all the volunteers and make a difference. We're in it together.